Hi, my name is Mike Parker, and we're going to discuss today what's a VMAX and what do you do with it and where does it go and uh, when, do you, when do you propose it. The VMAX is a classic high-end device, whatever that means. And, and a lot of people wonder, so what's a high-end device versus everything else? And, and, and a high-end device is actually fairly easy to explain. Okay, so a high-end device uh, is, is going to be designed to operate regardless of the, of the environment that, that it's in. Now essentially the thing to remember about a high-end device is that we use the same components and these components are commodities. We use the same commodities that, that everybody else does. However, we do a lot more engineering to ensure that it works. Um, the other thing to remember about a high-end device is that in many cases not only does the array itself have to work, but you have to start worrying about things like site resilience. So in other words, if your sprinkler system goes off or if your network lines get cut, you're probably going to need a secondary site. Um, and, and the VMAX is optimized to do this. Now the technology that we use, or the engineering point that we worry about in high-end is something that we call low probability, high impact events. And these are things that probably shouldn't happen, and statistically they won't, but if they do, they're going to have some considerable uh, impact. Now the way we get around that, we use a fairly, we, we use a large compute engine and we actually use a rather sophisticated operating system to get around these things that can fail because what happens in a large array, a large array is what we call event intensive, which means there's a lot of drives, there's a lot of software running, and a failure can <clears throat> set off a chain reaction and, and, and cause these things to fail. That's pretty much the design point. So the first thing you'll notice about a VMAX is that it's got a very large compute engine in front of the storage. That's the basic difference. We use the same components as our VNX product. Um, many of the competitors have a smaller compute engine in front, of the, in, in front of the storage. That's the first difference. The second difference is how you organize your operating system. And our operating system is designed, it's a custom operating system that we wrote line by line. Uh, we started in 1990. And it's designed to handle a lot of things at once because what's going to happen at the high end is that you're going to have a lot of drives, you're going to have some failures in the drives, maybe some failures in the components. You're going to probably want to copy this somewhere else, um, and you're going to want to run some applications. Now what really shifted in the VMAX world and what shifted in the high-end market is that we took this technology and we actually focused on solving the primary problem of 2011, or the current uh, problem, which is capex, capital expense and operational expense. In other words, we're going to start saving people operational money, both capex and opex. So unlike um, prior generations in which the, 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 the Symmetrics was just a higher priced solution. Now it's actually higher availability, but it can also be fairly cost effective to run. We're going to do that two ways, and, and in order to do that, we're going to have to save the customer clicks, and we're going to have to save the customer cost. The fundamental problem is that depending on whose numbers you use, for example, IDC thinks that in five years you're going to have ten times the amount of data that you do now. I've seen numbers where by 2020 you'll have 40 times the data that you have now. The problem is very simple. You're not going to get 40 times the people and you're not going to get 40 times the budget. Actually, despite your data growth, they're probably going to cut your budget and then they're probably going to cut the people. So we have to design around that. So that, that, that's what we're going to do. Now, <clears throat> let's discuss just a little bit of, of the, just a few of the things that we do uh, to make this available. A storage device is made out of a couple of commodities. For example, obviously the disks. Now the disks, we have a couple of different flavor, flavors. For example, we have fiber drives and we have SATA drives. And we'll, we'll, we'll ship SAS drives later when that, when that cost becomes um, uh, more cost effective for us and, and, and for you. Fiber drives, for example, requires some correction logic. Um, there, there's a tendency to, to, to uh, miss the data that you fly over a segment, and we, we use a correction mechanism to fix that. SATA drives, you worry about something called torn sectors. And we have technology that, that corrects that as well. So that's a good example of something where, where we have to correct a situation that occurs in these drives. For example, memory, likewise, is a commodity that by itself can't run in an enterprise. And so what we do is copy it. And there's any number of components that we go down through. For example, fiber, the fiber connection itself will corrupt about four bits for every terabyte that it writes.
And of course, that's not going to work in a critical environment. So of course, EMC has technology to fix that particular problem. So that's what we do from a raw engineering point of view. Now, <clears throat> the two other main uh, piece of technology that we introduced here was, like I said, we have to save you clicks and we have to save you cost. Now under saving clicks, we invented something called uh, virtual provisioning, or we call it VP. And what VP does is that instead of using drives, metal ones, stripes, all these things that we've been doing for years to get, ar to get around the spindle problems, we now use pool of drives. So best practices is 32 drives in that pool. And what you do is that when you write the data, you stripe across all these 32 drives. Okay, and what that saves the, <clears throat> the user from is stripes, metal ones, RAID, trying to figure out how to get these spindles to run. If you expand that group, say to 64 drives, we rebalance that pool in the background. Okay, that saves clicks, which is key to saving costs. Now, when, when you look at the overall device, what we do is we get several kinds of pools. For example, this might have 10K fiber drives, and we may have a pool of SATA drives. Now, the reason that we do that is fairly simple. We're trying to save your costs, and the way that we save your costs in the VMAX is by running most of your data on the SATA drives. Notice I said most. SATA drives are very inexpensive. This is how we save your money. We have a one terabyte drive, and we have a two terabyte drive. And if you ask me how fast they are, I'll tell you that they're not. But they're cost effective in the extreme. To offset that, we use a flash media. The flash media is fast in the extreme, but it's a little pricey. And so what we do is most of your data goes down here, save money. The data has to go up here, is up here, and it's fast in the extreme. And so this saves you money because you're, you're putting most of your data down here where it's cost effective. The part that has to go over here, uh, we put up there and, and your data runs well as, in addition. Now, <clears throat> the technology to do this, this is a very simple concept. And everybody's been trying to do this for years. Humans cannot keep up with this kind of a design. There's no way that you can hire enough technicians to do this manually. So we have to automate it. The way that we automate it, was something called FAST. It stands for Fully Automated Storage Tiering Virtual Provisioning. So in other words, you take this virtual provisioning, you add the FAST to it, and now all of a sudden all of this is automated. Now we're not going to get into all the details of how this works right now, but essentially um, on a chunk basis, which is 12 tracks, we put every 12 track chunk in the appropriate media. And then that way, most of your data is down here saving you money. The data has to run fast is up here. We have a piece of fiber in the middle um, for the things that are, that are sort of in transition. This fast adjusts the workload fairly quickly. It can adjust every, up to every 30 minutes. And it continuously tunes this in the background. You don't have to do it. Um, and by that, and that way, we make this the most cost effective, one of the more cost effective ways to uh, run storage. This is a hot technology. We are using this. This is what's driving our sales because what happens to, for a customer, now remember, this is going to get 10, 15, 20 times bigger. What the customers now do when they have this technology in place is that the management pretty much is what's my pool utilization? Well, that's 60%. Okay, we have enough drives. What about SATA? Well, that's. 60% to, okay, we have enough drives. How about the flash? Well, that's getting full. Okay, we'll order more of that. We can order that. We can put it in. It'll restripe. Um, and, and it just doesn't require a lot of, a lot of effort. We also have, in, in, the, in the VMAX, the, the, other tr the, the other trait to the VMAX is it has cutting edge, leading edge replication across sites. Now, for example, we have big uh, financial customers who literally replicate across continents. They, they replicate U.S. One customer replicates New York, Singapore, London. And, and they do that for you know, extreme availability. So if they have a power grid problem or something major that, that expands a big area, they've still got two more sites. That's the other part that happens in a, in a VMAX design. So we have to replicate that. That's been available since 1996, actually. 
and that's very common technology. So this can also be replicated. So let's sort of wrap up here. Essentially, the high end is, or the things that have to work, and if they if they don't work, um, you know, it's going to have a significant business impact. Most of the cases is financial impact. In other words, the easy way to do this is to figure out how much revenue comes flows through the site and dividing by an hour or maybe two hours, which would be a normal outage. If that's a big number, you're probably looking at a high end. Notice, for example, that high end accounts can be very different. For example, we all, we all understand big banks, but think about an airline. Is that a high end application? Well, it is because it's very expensive to ground planes while you're trying to get your system back up. Uh, big casinos can act like high-end devices, credit card companies obviously. Hospitals are more life and death. Law enforcement is, is more life and death. They want to know who they're stopping. Um, you can get into a situation where it seems minor, but in fact it turns out to be high-end. For example, big department stores don't want their return uh, department down because the, because, because the storage has failed that will also act like a high-end device. For everything else where, I mean, no one wants anything to fail, but for everything else, it may, be a, it may well be a mid-range solution. So again, look for what a cost if it fails in, in financial terms, human terms. If you have a high-end device, then you're worried about the technology, and we're gonna engineer for these low impact, I mean, I'm sorry, low probability, high impact events. We're gonna engineer for that at the same time, we're going to save you cost, we're going to save you clicks, we're going to make it easier to use, we're going to reduce the number of people that you need to run it, at the same time providing the very high end of, uh, of availability.